So good evening, everyone, and welcome to another great event brought to you from Upstart and Crow. Uh, my name is Ian Gill, and I'm a co-founder of Upstart and Crow, which is a literary arts studio operating on stolen land, unseated by the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations in what is otherwise known as uh, Vancouver's Granville Island. Those of you who have been following our events this season will know that we've had a great lineup of leading authors and thinkers who've been tackling really big issues in novel and interesting ways. And tonight is no exception, except that I have a small conflict of interest to declare. In addition to being a co-founder of Upstart and Crow, I'm also a co-founder of an initiative called Salmon Nation. Salmon Nation is our sponsoring partner tonight, and Salmon Nation is also an opportunity to think about where we live from Northern California right up to the North Slope of Alaska um, as a nature state. Think of where we live as a nature state, not a nation state. And to think about that and what we can do to live well in this incredible corner of the world and to build the kind of communities where diverse cultures and diversified economies and natural systems can all thrive together. It's actually a pretty big idea, it's a pretty big geography, but ours is a region full of innovators and brilliant leaders and entrepreneurs who are meeting the challenges of climate change and even the COVID pandemic head on. We think there is unsung genius in communities the length and breadth of Salmon Nation and sharing ideas from outside the power centers of big government and big money seems like the right thing to do. So about that conflict of interest, my guest tonight is Christopher Brookfield, who happens also to be a co-founder of Salmon Nation and a dear friend and colleague. What's more, the book he is launching tonight, Field Notes from Systems Change, speaks very closely to the work we are trying to do in Salmon Nation. Chris is a systems designer. He's worked in edge communities in the Peruvian highlands, rural India, in central Mexico, and even just across the border in Skagit County uh, in Washington State. He has found economic opportunity in small, often impoverished communities, and has done pioneering work investing in communities that conventional capital often ignores. Field Notes from Systems Change is a marvelous assembly of insights from Chris's on the ground experiences and a roadmap for how we can build more regenerative economies and communities right around the world, including here at home in Salmon Nation. So, Chris, welcome to Upstart and Crow, and congratulations on the launch of your wonderful new book. Hi, Ian. Hey. It's nice to be here. <laughs> there you are. How are you? You know, I'm doing great. I am in your bookstore at Upstart and Crow. And yeah, well, it's, uh, it's very nice to, to be here. here. And uh, look, thank you for joining us and thank you for um, taking the time and trouble uh, to produce this marvelous book. It's a uh, slim volume, um, which is actually pretty de rigueur these days. Um, people are really interested in seizing on good ideas and actually getting to the meat of them. And you do that in this book, and you do it based on your remarkable travels and what you've done on those travels, um, and more to the point, what you've learned along the way. So tell us, what have you learned, and what is the sort of essence of this book? The essence of the book is that um, local people in edge communities um, have this incredible advantage in that their curiosity and their imagination doesn't need to be bounded by what is going on uh, in the more powerful centers. And so you just see this amazing um, renaissance of uh, life and creativity in places that have been described previously as being um, things called like marginalized or things called like slums. And it's, it, it's in these places where you can see just um, the, the, the most remarkable uh, ingenuity. And so 
I wrote the book because I had done uh, been involved with a number of pretty significant projects around the world, all of which started from uh, local people and local insights. And it seemed very random and very kind of ad hoc and, 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 and almost kind of miraculous and, and almost 180 degrees to the convention um, that I was uh, um, encultured with in the United States. And so I, I, I wrote the book for a number of reasons just to say, um, hey, uh, system change is happening. It's happening all around us. It tends to be happening more and more frequently and more powerfully in places that are difficult for powerful people to get to and starts to make uh, a significant claim, but the claim is really made through example more than through argument. And the claim is that um, we don't need to necessarily uh, transmit the social and system change that we wanna see through the political route. So we don't necessarily need to uh, vote people out or change laws, we might be able to go directly from changing how we live to building the systems to support how we would like to live um, directly. And you see that happening, it's probably an overused phrase in a way, but sort of almost organically in these communities. Yeah, you know, so whether it was in India where you'd see um, possibly an entire lack of uh, social and uh, essential services um, or in uh, Skagit County or up in uh, central BC uh, where I've been exploring and thinking and learning with you, um, there's oftentimes these uh, very pronounced uh, scarcities that are, can be frightening to people from uh, colonial power centers. Maybe there's no money. Maybe there's not a lot of sanitation. Maybe there's uh, really difficult transportation. And yet you see these communities um, adapting uh, to these scarcities in these most ma magical ways. And my experience, and this is just me as a human saying, I continued to find in all of the edges around the world that I got to be welcomed into, I almost always found more genuine exuberance and happiness in these places, notwithstanding uh, the scarcities and the inventions um, that people were making to make their lives work uh, were, were really astounding. Um, and, and so what's your, uh, you did a lot of work, for instance, in microcredit, um, and everyone has a view of microcredit, you know, it's Grameen Bank, it's Muhammad Yunus and a Nobel Prize and, uh, you know, all of that stuff. And there's this notion that it's essentially fed by philanthropy, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, another way to do handouts. Um, what did you see as the opportunity to kind of change the dial a bit on microcredit into something that was frankly, far more impactful um, in the long run. So, you know, when talking about microcredit, it's important to know that um, it's, it's, a, it's a vast undertaking involving millions and millions of people uh, across um, dozens of nations. Um, and so it's a little bit, uh, my own sense of humility is challenged to, talk about it too much, right? But what we did was we were uh, exposed to Muhammad Yunus, who did win the Nobel Prize subsequently. And um, I noticed two things. One of the things I noticed was that uh, he had focused enormously on um, teaching other microcredit practitioners in a process of replication to launch new microcredit organizations that were completely outside of his control. And that's in and of itself kind of a radical idea uh, to uh, basically 
uh, give up control so that you might actually see a proliferation, a replication and imitation. The second thing was that he was very devoted to his institution, which I was about 35 years old, remaining a, a nonprofit. Um, but we didn't think as a nonprofit we could reach um, the, the scope of the prop, the scope of poverty in India itself is so huge and so enormous. We didn't think that all the philanthropy in the world was enough to address the problem. So what we did um, in a collaborative way was um, transform uh, philanthropically funded microcredit organizations in India into entrepreneurial companies. And in doing so, um, we ended up helping these uh, microcredit entrepreneurs become a part of the banking system in India. And they uh, subsequently raised billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, from the same banks and from Wall Street um, that's normally thought of as totally at odds or even antagonistic uh, to the plight of poverty. And so, so that, was, that, was, that was a big piece of what we did in India um, I ended up learning a lot more than just the financial uh, piece of it, but the financial piece was important and I think begins to uh, point to how some of the other systemic challenges we're facing uh, could be addressed. I mean, finance has a pretty bad rap, <laughs> just generally. Um, you know, if you want to talk about hedge funds and all that sort of stuff, we could spend the rest of the evening doing that and not even get to the edges of that conversation. But finance also is really an interesting way of organizing activity, isn't it? I mean, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not all good always, but what you describe is basically using finance as a uh, methodology, as, a, as a, a, a way to gather people around some ideas and, and actually, uh, uh, as a tool of human empowerment. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of where my work ended up going was into um, uh, smaller and smaller local areas. And uh, what I started to learn was that it's actually super difficult to do a true collective undertaking. Um, and I know, I know for some people, this kind of seems backwards, but uh, what finance is actually really good at is helping uh, ordinary people organize collective undertakings. Mm -hmm. And so that has become kind of a, a, a I think of finance as more a, um, a, a, a system instead of relationships um, so that um, ordinary people can actually uh, federate and and to and to come together around a project, um, and I, I still I still see it that way. And this notion that you referenced a moment ago of replication, I mean, it does seem that um, there's myriad good ideas out there, and we're seeing more and more of them today as people I think are becoming skeptical of existing business models and existing governance models. There are a lot of good ideas out there, but it's it's the, um, the replication of them and the sharing of them that really goes to the heart of the kind of community building you're talking about. So that's that seems to be the key is you're, okay, you can do that there. There are slightly condi different conditions here. How can we replicate that? How can we share that quickly? And how do we accelerate those ideas seems to be really core. Yeah, so one of the um, one of my sources of hope is actually I helped raise up a flour mill uh, with Kevin Morse and a number of um, farmers and um, uh, local people in Skagit County. And um, from the beginning, I was really committed to the idea 
that this flour mill um, would benefit by purchasing from local farmers, by um, supplying local bakeries, and even more so by having um, investors who were from the county. And so we basically uh, built a fairly significant uh, piece of the food system um, almost entirely within 50 miles of where the grain was being grown. And what I found is that um, if you're willing to integrate and kind of hold the fact that we're doing local farming with local farmers, very healthy, very high quality, um, and then integrate all the way up the stack to the ownership of the flour mill so that the, uh, the mill itself was owned by the county, by the people in the county, it had an incredible resonance. Um, not only do people like the flour and like eating the bread, um, they love the fact that this flour mill seemed to almost rise up magically from their own people. And it gave people a sense of agency. It gave people a sense of the potential for forward progress. And I just, you know, this is kind of some of where my path in life, um, you know, has some, some special um, visibility. That couldn't have happened if the flour mill had been owned by the government in the county. And it couldn't have happened if the flour mill had been owned by some um, placeless billionaire. Uh, it only happened because there were so many shareholders who were part of the county um, that this was viewed as part of the fabric of the county. This was this was something they could feel pride in, and that they could they could really participate in. And I, you know, that's that's a big part of the message in the book is that if we're going to make change, it's all around us, but it's really important to be sensitive to um, issues of ownership, uh, agency, and the fact that people are super smart and people really um, are on the lookout for any sense that there's a shell game going on or that um, there, there's some sort of scam or there's some sort of, um, um, you know, flaw in the, in the authenticity of the system. And, and that's what, you know, that's what we found in the flour mill. And the, in the rest of the book, there's about seven or eight examples like the flour mill, where um, in order to bring a community together, we were actually uh, forced by circumstances to embrace the polar opposite um, community members in the county. So with that flour mill, we had extraordinarily conservative uh, large scale farmers. We had organic farmers. Uh, we had classical progressive liberals. Um, we were able to actually embrace the entire full swath of um, kind of political orientation. And more and more and more that I'm becoming convinced that, um, that that's actually an essential element of community level uh, systemic transformation is, is, is being willing to hold um, extraordinarily um, uh, wide um, viewpoints uh, into the same project. Yeah, because the conventional politics that we have now, the sort of party political system, again, is just another way of organizing energy uh, and actually, unfortunately, organizing energy around what divides us, not what attracts us to each other or brings us together. And so, um, I mean, again, I'm intrigued by uh, this notion you say somewhere in the book about human empowerment as being the ultimate business model. I mean, that's a really, that's a, that's a kind of a cool idea. It's a radical idea, but it's a really cool idea. Yeah. Um, the, the last sec section of the book um, goes 
pretty technically into some ideas around business. And uh, one of the things that I, I came to see was that um, traditional, what we, what many of us think about business is, the, is, is an artifact. So many of us think that it's normal to do thin slices, do segmented marketing. And what I saw is that segmented marketing and these sort of thin slices, the way people think of business, actually helped to divide us. And so then you take the political system on top of that, and the political system has actually adopted many of these same techniques. Mm -hmm. And so the political system is using uh, direct marketing, Facebook, thin sliced of demographics. And every time you thin slice a community like that, what you're actually doing is separating it. And so for me, what I find, um, you know, my real kind of excitement is when we can see um, an essential service um, that includes the whole community. Because when you start to think about designing for a whole community, as opposed to these thin slices, you're forced to design services that actually bring people together. And in order to do that, you have to start thinking more and more locally. Um, you, you just simply, it's too hard, I think, or at least too hard for me to entertain something that's global uh, that actually brings people together. And so as, as you start to look county by county by county or province by province by province, you can start to see these similarities. And that, that's, a big, that's a big piece of the book um, but I, I actually follow it through into the way, um, the way, way most of us end up experiencing business and with the way we experience business is as this, um, uh, highly proprietary, highly competitive, um, divisive force. And what, where I've gotten to myself is just realizing, um, that, that, that's an artifact that, Prior to about 1950, uh, most businesses and most services were local and had to appeal to the whole community and to be successful. And so, so I'm starting to kind of highlight um, the differences um, between uh, why local businesses actually feel better to us. Mm. Um, I mean, it's what's wonderful about your book is um, because, you know, the experiences of rural India, of central Mexico, of the highlands of Peru, of Skagit County and everything, um, they seem pretty, pretty disparate. And, and, you know, the, I mean, even in Skagit County, although it's a relatively poor county in North American terms, you know, it's still in one of the most prosperous countries in the world. Uh, what's really interesting about your book then is how you, tie um, what you see at a sort of systemic level into a model that you, uh, or into a description that you, you a process actually that you articulate called the Nautilus process. Um, tell us uh, what you mean by that, because it really is a, a kind of a very um, vibrant description of how all these things you're talking about actually start to come together to build community and to build around these essential human services that communities need to survive. So the Nautilus is, is, a, is a metaphor uh, that fundamentally talks about alignment and place and community and how opportunity uh, comes out of those um, places. And for me, it was really I got to spend a lot of time, uh, you know, weeks, months, years uh, in rural India working with microcredit. And I, I was able to bring just a remarkably wide array of people into uh, local villages in India. And it, it was really touching for me. I mean, it was, it was, it was um, incredible. And specifically what's incredible is seeing a group of five women um, jointly guarantee each other's trust and to see the um, sort of flowering of personal confidence and um, empowerment. But I brought in uh, venture capitalists, I brought in hedge fund managers, I brought in owners of some of the really big, big banks, 
scientists, all kinds of different people. And almost universally, when you had Western, highly analytical people uh, come into a village in India, they would, uh, they would be crying within 20 minutes. And it happened to me too. So it wasn't like, um, and I started to wonder what, what's going on here. Uh, and what I started to learn was that um, from a systems level, uh, a lot of highly educated people in Europe and North America are operating quite far up a stack where they actually think that the whole world is just analysis. And, you know, you, we hear a lot about data-driven or data-driven um, ideas. And I finally had to throw that all out the window because the, the numbers and the data were not telling the story. Uh, the story could only be seen in, in, in this case in, through, through, through my own personal experience. Like by seeing the systems personally, and participating in them personally, I could start to feel why they were working or why they weren't working. And um, I'd come from a background that was pretty techie and, uh, you know, pretty, you know, we could think of Silicon Valley, um, where the reigning myth is that um, life begins at data and there's, there's nothing pre-data. And I just kind of threw that out the window and said, you know what? Uh, love and intuition and uh, a sense of uh, alignment and uh, place, that all precedes uh, imagination. And without imagination, none of these systems are, are possible. And so the Nautilus is basically a way to look at uh, building systems um, that, that acknowledges that, yeah, uh, analytical methods are important, they help us build things, they help us engineer things. Um, but how do we know where to build the bridge? Well, the only way to know how to build the bridge is to experience the river, okay? And so the Nautilus is my sort of offering to say, hey, for people who are interested in social or systems change, I think we need to be more tolerant and we actually need to reach across to different ways of thinking and really embrace them into our interdisciplinary collaborations. And so I've been, that's one of the things, you know, I'm trying to do with Salmon Nation is, is to really um, in an intentional way say, yeah, okay, um, let's, let's put an artist together with a mathematician. Let's put an engineer together with um, an elder in an edge community. Um, these kinds of, um, relationships through difference are actually the most powerful way to start really designing uh, new systems. And I guess if there's one message that I, there's a lot in here, but, but this is one I feel really, really strongly about is that in the U.S. on the West Coast, there has become a divide where there's almost animosity between uh, people who have a humanistic viewpoint or maybe they're artists, or maybe they're historians, and then the data people. Um, there's a lot of ill feeling and antagonism. Uh, and I wanted to kind of, through, through real world examples that I, I, I'd participated in, put a little call out to the world and say, you know what? If we really wanna see the change we wanna see, we, we need to start uh, really getting over our uh, silos and our hangups. Um, we need the artists, we need the engineers, we need the analysis, we need the experience. And so the Nautilus at the, at the heart of it is really just a roadmap to help people see who they really need to be finding. And it, over and over again, what I've discovered is that um, we tend to uh, go off to try to do something great and surround ourselves with all people who are just like ourselves. Um, and that's just natural. It kind of seems to happen. Um, but at this moment in time where we're looking at, uh, you know, many generations of change that we have to accomplish in 10 or 15 years or 20 years, um, to really sort of put a call out to say, um, we need to explicitly embrace empathy, compassion, and intuition and embrace 
data, analysis, and technology. And that to the extent that we continue to um, kind of hate on these two different silos, the humanities and the uh, data, um, we're playing into the same status quo um, uh, indecision and indecisiveness um, that we're also frustrated with. I mean, it's interesting you say um, we need to do almost several generations of work in less than one generation. It does feel that urgent um, and it feels like there's a lot of capacity to make you know, maybe some big errors along the way or um, but also to make some big bets along the way. Um, but the notion of the sort of regenerative communities that you talk about and have championed in your book and in your thinking and in your work um, is really coming into its own right now. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, we've seen people starting to move away from the cities, partly because they're too expensive, but also because they're just not viable and in some cases not good places to be anymore. So people are looking to build lives of, frankly, greater purpose where they can um, in these edge communities. And what I hear and see all the time you know, is where we have central control, where the governments are centralized, where capital is centralized, and where people think all the innovation is and everything else actually is wrong. There's so much innovation in what we've come to call edge communities, but capital never gets to it and the leadership never gets out to see it. So we've, we've got to kind of turn everything inside out. And it's, and, you know, I guess to be used, you know, what could be seen as pejorative language, the hippies have been saying to this for 50, saying this to us for 50 years, uh, and of course, the hippies in the end are always right. It's just it's taken us a while to catch up to them. Um, so this is really a moment, isn't it, for the kind of work that you're describing here. Uh, this is a moment to actually shift capital and what our conception of where power is radically out of these centralized systems that have frankly failed us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, at a big level, that's what I think we all feel uh, challenge and conflict, but I think there's some hope in it. I think that if you start to look at it all, I always think about it as like the king's court and the monarchy. Uh, in a monarchy, which is very centralized, the only thing that matters from the point of view of the monarch is that which he or she can see. So everything that's formal is designed to be seen from the center. But if you go back through art and literature uh, and just your own experience, um, it's clear that all of the all the radical transformations have happened outside of the formal systems and they've happened out in the edges. And we just happen to live in this kind of funky upside down time when um, technology and venture capital, which used to actually be a fringy, edgy thing 40 or 50 years ago, has gotten so powerful um, that the mechanism to kind of fund uh, edge innovation has essentially turned into its own conglomeration. And it's, I think people are seeing this everywhere, which is that um, change is happening precisely where it can't be seen from the center. Because if it could be seen from the center, the center would find ways to squash it. So that's why I get so excited in rural India or the highlands of Peru, which are distinctly remote. But I also get very excited uh, visiting uh, indigenous communities on the West Coast, um, places where the tractor beam of central control is necessarily less. And the part that I bring to this is just to say, okay, I happen to know a lot about crypto and blockchain. And, you know, that's part of, part of my creative groups are people who are involved with that. And I'm here to say, yeah, 
the farther you are out on the edge, the more you want to actually reach across to some of these groups who are creating decentralized technologies. But it's not just decentralized technologies through crypto. Um, Ian and I were recently up in Haida Gwaii, and we've also been to the Health Sick Nation a few times. And those places are creating their own sense of a decentralized architecture. Mm -hmm. um, they're moving, they're not trying to move closer to Vancouver. They're actually trying to fortify and build their own cultures in their own way. And that is decentralization as well. So was the flour mill. Our flour mill in Skagit County is essentially fragmenting and decentralizing the food system. And it's fractal. You keep going down through the layers of sort of edge and formal culture and you keep finding more and more magical creativity. It just, it's like bottomless. Um, and that's the, that's the part that really gets me excited right now is this idea that um, most, most of us know we have to build new power systems, new water systems, new farming systems, new living systems. And they're already there. If we just have the humility to, admit, to, to kind of admit that as people who are kind of centrally placed or in a position of power, we're never gonna be able to see those from downtown Vancouver or downtown Seattle. The only, point, well, the only way to find these innovations is to go and immerse and to actually participate with them. Uh, and that, 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 you know, to me, that's, that's a pretty big idea, but it's simple because it all is just a flip of humility. Do we look for answers in the King's court? Or do we look for answers outside of the walls of the castle? And I think we probably need to look outside the walls of the castle. Well, and when we go to places like Haida Gwaii and, um, you know, one leads to the Bella Bella um, and the Hazeltons and everything else, there is, you called it, I think, a sort of sense of exuberance. There is real energy. There is a real um, sense of possibility in these communities that, begins to indicate both a way out of um, the, the stuck systems that we're in, but also a way towards um, actual decolonization, actual you know, um, restoration of dignity and purpose and uh, cultural strength in communities that we've tried mightily hard to oppress. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, the, I'm a little bit, I, I, I started writing this before I actually really understood what decolonization was. Um, and it was only after the fact that I kind of got to listen enough and experience enough to, to really get my mind into the, uh, pattern of uh, appropriation, rejection, and, uh, and, and harming uh, that are core dynamics of a colonial process. Um, I now can see looking back that some of, the, some of the warmth and some of the beauty and the love that I could feel in edge communities is, is actually tapping into um, the same kind of um, awakening um, that we're seeing in British Columbia around decolonization and decolonization. It's, it's, it's all, it's part of the, it's, the stories are consonant. They're not the same, but they're working in the same ways. It, it does strike me too that um, as we try and move through generations of urgent work in a very short period of time to kind of recontour how communities work um, in and of themselves and also with each other and how we replicate good ideas. It does seem to me that the places where the uptake could be highest for that are places that have been ignored or really, um, to use the term you used earlier, marginalised by the industrial economy and by the sort of top-down governance systems that we impose. Um, 
so it's kind of almost a natural thing that the people who've benefited least from you know this you know industrial boom of 80 years or whatever else are, are um, possibly the most uh, capable of even imagining what it's like to live without those systems and what it's like to experiment with new systems, some of which depend on very ancient knowledge. The way I always feel about it is I, you know, I was involved with this flour mill, so I, you know, learned how to bake and uh, love sourdough baking and I love it. Uh, but I also learned a, about a lot of different kinds of fermentation. And the way I actually experience it is that um, the crush of industrial uh, linear top-down systems since 1950, really post-World War II, has been so astounding and so universal that in most white spaces, you can't find a culture that hasn't been almost entirely created as a vessel to hold these industrial processes. So if you, if you want to find change, what I'm finding is look, look to the edges where there's still a medium. Like I actually mean like a real medium, like a medium, like a culture. There's still an organizational culture in the edges of salmon nation in North America that can remember what it was like to be human um, before we all in collectively became reorganized as industrial cogs. And so it's very intuitive to me that if we really wanna find solutions to climate change or for social justice or for other issues like that, we might, it, it might be more fruitful for us to look in partnership into how the edges are living because they still have a collective memory and a cultural memory, a medium of how they existed prior to the industrial processes that created climate change in the first place. And, and there's also in a lot of those communities been less migration out of them. You know, so um, there is something really um, residual there that you don't find in communities that have just sort of invented themselves because they happen upon a resource they wanted to exploit. And then suddenly there's a community there, but the community is not built around um, your generations of knowledge and experience. It's built around a generation of opportunism. Yeah, our, our uh, you know, our European and American uh, cultural memory is uh, extraordinarily short. And, um, you know, uh, it will, it already seems, you know, there's uh, shopping malls all over America closing down. Uh, they're, they're, uh, shopping malls are going to feel like a dinosaur kind of thing uh, in the next five years. Uh, there are innumerable patterns of organization that could only exist um, because of the uh, carbon economy. And I, I think they're gonna look really, um, really ephemeral uh, and, 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 and really kind of temporary uh, over the next 50 years. To me, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just kind of an obviousness, which is, I, I actually lived for a long, long time in Seattle. Um, Seattle seems to me to like the worst place to look for uh, answers. Um, it's a place that has already been uh, homogenized. It's already reorganized itself around technology. Um, it's quite unsurprising. It's not like a, a place that you, that I find to be sort of full of magic or full of unexplained or um, kismet. Um, so what I, I still don't really understand, I guess my brain doesn't function in the right way, but I, I really don't understand why so many smart people are looking right back into the same institutions that created the foundations for the situation we're in to find the answers for how to get out of them. Yeah, it is. Um, well, and that's where, to some degree, 
um, something like philanthropy, for instance, which is often then waved as being the kind of, you know, the, the container for, you know, saving ourselves from ourselves, also seems like a really barren idea. You know, the, I mean, philanthropy has actually been invented by owners of capital to, you know, create a bit of a escape valve um, but it's not a real thing in terms of actual systems change. It's, it's, it's how can it be when it's part of a system has been designed by the most powerful system to be part of that system um, and really create a kind of a, um, a set of dependencies uh, in communities that you know, really have all the resources they need if they have the confidence and the knowledge to replicate and to actually even go back into replicating ways they used to live before. There's, if you look over the longer arc of the history of philanthropy, which I know better from, from America than I do in Canada, so I'm no expert in Canada. Um, the forum was created uh, specifically to subordinate uh, philanthropic efforts to commercial efforts. And it's subordinated in a whole host of ways. But for me, more important than the structural um, subordination implied legally is that working in communities, I could feel and I could see that community members themselves we're highly resistant to the structure of relationships that come in with philanthropy. So people, whether it's in India or Central Coast BC or Skagit, Peru, when I got close enough to be friends and to be at dinner tables, it was very clear that people didn't want charity. And they understood that that was a subordinating relationship structure on the ground. What they really wanted to be was agents and entrepreneurs. They really wanted to have control and a feeling that they were actually moving their own futures forward. And so I don't actually think philanthropy is gonna get us through most, much of this, um, primarily because uh, you know, we need a lot of the nine billion or eight and a half billion people on the planet working um, to rebuild systems um, to get us around this turn we're in. Uh, it's a big pickle we're in. And if people in everyday communities really don't like the relationship structure of charity, it's not going to be very useful. So this is one thing I've been struck with is as I get to um, more and more um, intact and integrated edge communities, there's less and less interest in philanthropy and more and more interest in how they might actually build their own economies and build their own local systems according to their own uh, needs. So um, we have a few questions, Chris, uh, um, obviously because the audience is unimpressed with my ability to ask questions and they've decided to ask their own, so good for them. Um, but uh, how, uh, so here's a question. How do you meet an ease resistance to these dis deeper systems changes, especially among those who still have a kind of hyper individualistic mindset? You know, if when you, hopefully some people will read some of the book, um, I never really say I have answers for anything. All I could really kind of say is, here's some stuff and it worked. Uh, sometimes I don't even know what it worked. It just worked. Um, and what I, what I do when I do mentoring, and I also taught at a university, I, I, I try to remind people to communicate with institutions, governments, and other people in the language they can understand. So making oneself legible across boundaries is actually really, really important. So I, I can work with someone who's very individualistic or incredibly selfish or even really greedy. Actually, if someone's really greedy, it's kind of easy 
as I know their language. So when we um, were really, uh, you know, very quickly growing microcredit in India, one of the huge insights was uh, we needed money from the banks of, in India. And the banks in India, not only do they not understand poverty, they kind of hate it. There's a lot of racism and caste boundaries uh, that are embedded in India. So we instead said, asked ourselves, what is the language of banks? Well, the language of banks are is profit and loss and did you pay, pay me back? So we made sure that we borrowed money from the biggest banks in India and paid them back. And then over time, by speaking the language of the bank, the bank ended up having an interest, a literal stake in the poor borrowers. And some of our most fierce allies became the banks in India, not because the banks in India cared at all, but because they actually had credits and stakes in the microcredit borrowers themselves. So that's, what, that's the one thing I would just sort of offer there is Skagit County, same thing, some very conservative people, some very uh, progressive people, people from different walks of life. We were able to find ways through the flour mill and through the universality of bread. Bread is a wonderful thing because it speaks to all people. And, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's almost like in the DNA. Um, and so that's what I would kind of say is uh, find how to be legible and speak the language across the boundary and spend a little less time trying to convert people because it's too hard. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, here's another question. What we might understand is at a systemic level or structural level is sometimes difficult to then implement in our own lives. How do we begin to move towards some of the ideas you're speaking to? Um, so I'll try to do this quickly. Um, one of the most powerful things I ever saw was a, a swarm of bees in my yard, filled the whole sky. And within an hour, these bees had uh, coalesced uh, onto the um, uh, elbow uh, of a plum tree. And they just got tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And they're doing their bee dance thing, you know, like they're all moving in different ways. And, there must have been 10,000 bees hanging off this plum tree. Uh, when I went to work the next morning, uh, the bees had already started to form a hive around their own bodies. So they were using their bodies and the movement of their bodies as the form for a new structure for this new hive. And I think that's kind of where we're all at a little bit, which is none of us know really what's at the bottom of this waterfall. But I think that the everyday patterns that we choose to live by are gonna be the patterns that the new systems that we're creating are going to, uh, are gonna to have to support. So what that means in everyday well is as simple as a flower box, as simple as baking some bread, as simple as, um, going for a walk in a forest, these are incredibly simple everyday behaviors that nourish us. And if we all do them, um, even people who are doing more abstract system building are gonna have to build systems to accommodate how we wanna live. So at the end of the day, my, my thing is, we need to just start living the way we wanna live as much as we can. And it may be simple, and it may sometimes seem actually so small and insignificant as to be trivial. Um, but that's how the change happens. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, going for a walk in the forest does somewhat depend on the centralized systems that we have in British Columbia, for instance, leaving some forest for us to walk in. Uh, that would be a nice thing. Um, sorry, that was my old um, eco trust. Uh, ethos creeping in there. But yeah, um, uh, I think you're right. I think this notion that we need to start living the way we want to live in the world and be in the world uh, is essential. Um, and you, I was just reading Arno Kopecky's book today, The Environmentalist Dilemma. 
you know, and he's talking about the fact that eventually if enough of us start living in a certain way and being serious about it, the politicians will catch up to the fact that that's the way we want to live and they'll actually create some policies that support that because that's the only way they're going to get back in. Um, that takes a big leap of faith. Um, uh, finally, um, uh, there's another question and I think we're going to have to wrap up and let people go, but there's a, a question here. Um, I love this story so much. I'd love to know your thoughts, Chris, on how to organize community when there is a perception that no community exists among a locality that people only feel sort of um, uh, connected by their zip code. So, uh, you know, and, and I think media and storytelling has had, this is another beef of mine, but, you know, the way we hear stories now and the way we share stories is so divided and so segmented and siloed again that it's really hard to build community when people are talking to each other. I... I have a hard time myself imagining how to build community in a Southern Californian um, suburban development. Uh, people are so, uh, they're already living in pods and they're already mutually isolated. I, I see a lot more hope in, in, um, in, 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 in cities and in, 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 in places that aren't, it, it seems to me that um, geographies that are defined by uh, autom long automobile commutes mm -hmm. are are actually the opposite of what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about looking out to the edges where people actually have some significant scarcities that have brought forward creativity and 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 maybe a more beautiful way to live. The 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 opposite pole to that is kind of a a suburban neighborhood with a 75 mile commute. Uh, what would that be? 100, 100, 100 kilometer commute each way. Um, those communities have been, the only reason they can exist is because of transportation and fossil fuels. And the organization pattern is entirely dependent upon it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a good question. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping, and in, in some pr really practical ways, including some collaborations with Ian, I believe that as we come out of the pandemic, um, there is going to be an enormous flourishing in in-person uh, communal activity, whether it's in bookstores. I mean, it happened to be an upstart in Crow bookstore in Granville Island, but it's also going to be plays. Um, people, the stories that are coming out of New York right now with people going to see plays again, um, they're having the same experience in their communal uh, theaters that I was trying to describe in the villages in India. People are crying on Broadway right now uh, mm -hmm. because the experience of being with other people is so powerful and so profound. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And I, I just kind of hope that uh, a year from now, five years from now, uh, we all do actually remember um, how isolating it was to be a, being alone during the pandemic. Um, because it's in contrast to that, I think that the importance of community, community building, community organization, um, and the and the intense need for it um, becomes impossible to ignore. And is that, so uh, there's one final question for our audience and we really are gonna have to wrap up, but that uh, the question is, what is the key to designing for a full community, especially when the community is very divided? Um, I think you almost answered part of that question then, but um, you know, we, we're either going to come out of the pandemic with a great flourishing desire to be close to each other again, and you know, uh, but we're, we're also, um, the pandemic has really exaggerated and, and um, in some cases exacerbated the sort of just depth of divisions between us. So how do you design for a full community when so much of it is sort of rent? So in the introduction to the book, I tell a story of living on a, a dirt road on a, a farm that was lent to me. And I actually intentionally uh, pursued friendship uh, with two other families. Uh, one was a 
totally gun-toting, uh, apocalyptic um, family. Uh, and the other was sort of a back to the land kind of family, but they both were farming. They both had root cellars. Um, they both um, were worried about change that was coming from outside of their control. And one thing I do in thinking about community design is try to actually find the most oppositional members of the community and start there. Because if you can find tissue that connects the most oppositional parts of a community, it's probably going to include most of the people in between. Uh, the other thing I do is uh, I've, I oftentimes have immersed for uh, even as long as a year, year and a half into an edge community. And what I'm really looking for when I do that is I'm looking for the most functional relationships between people. And uh, that's what I'm really noticing. That's what I'm taking notes on. That's that's what I'm really trying to say. Because my belief is that um, if you can if you can notice a really constructive and genuine relationship, then you can start to actually build systems that replicate those kinds of relationships. So those are two 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 attempts to answer the question. But the question is a big question. Um, but I do think it's important for us to try to design for the edges of the distribution and not the average. When we design for the average, uh, we almost always leave out um, all the tails. And then the other thing that I, I really believe works is um, um, being sensitive to when there's actually something functioning in it and really trying to uh, use that as your clay for the system design. Chris, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for writing this book. Um, thank you for sharing your uh, findings so generously. And as it happens, um, I think we're going to see each other again next week at the Festival of What Works. So um, just a final uh, note here and then yet another part of my uh, sets of conflicts of interest, if you will. Um, People who are following and joining Salmon Nation probably already know this, but for the second pandemic year in a row now, Salmon Nation has put on a wonderful storytelling and idea fest focusing on what works, focusing on some of the things that Chris and I have been talking about. So just like tonight, we want to share bold ideas and hear from leaders doing creative work to make their community stronger and healthier for everyone. So please search up the uh, Festival of What Works. Um, you can find that online. You'll find marvelous program of events starting next Tuesday and running through the week, uh, the following week through to uh, the following Sunday. You might catch a glimpse of Chris there again. And if you can bear it, uh, I might put in an appearance as well. Uh, come play with some more big ideas next week at the Festival of What Works. For now, thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks again, Chris. And we hope to see you all soon in Salmon Nation. Thank you and good night.